Good morning. Um, let's wait a few more seconds for folks to come in. Um, I'm Dekel. With me, uh, Ferran from the Cloud Foundry team. We're going to walk you through uh, an overview for Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry Open Platform as a Service, and then a deep dive on the integration we've done uh, on top of OpenStack with Cloud Foundry and Cloud Foundry Bosch. And um, let's make this interactive. So if there are any questions, please ask them. This is not intended to be a deaf by PowerPoint. So um, really, ask questions. So Cloud Foundry is now part of Pivotal. Pivotal is a company formed by uh, assets from VMware and EMC, uh, officially launched April 1st as a um, independent entity. Uh, we've been working as a virtual org for a few months now. It's basically the idea is to create a platform for next generation applications that has data, big data, platform as a service, and can run on any cloud. So different assets from VMware, EMC, coming together under one company, which is Pivotal. So we are all one happy family now, and Cloud Foundry is a part of Pivotal, and we're going to explain um, how that works and specifically talk about OpenStack. So, <coughs> whoa, uh, that was a big so. So what is Cloud Foundry? Cloud Foundry is a PaaS, platform as a service, which focuses mainly on making developers, such as yourself, more productive, enable you guys to focus on code, writing great apps, and not plumbing middleware infrastructure, dealing with routers, load balancers, databases. The idea of Cloud Foundry is to allow you guys to write code, deploy in seconds, let the past do the rest. We are focusing on, we said productive, we want to be open, so Cloud Foundry main differentiator is it can run on any cloud, vSphere, vCloud, AWS, OpenStack. The idea is that it's very easy to port cloud applications on top of Cloud Foundry between clouds. You will see um, in a few minutes how we made the integration into OpenStack um, using Cloud Foundry Bosch, which is the underlying mechanism that basically allows us to be multi-cloud. It's very easy to extend Cloud Foundry and to scale apps running on Cloud Foundry. We'll talk about that as well. So the idea of this slide is not to get into definitions of what is PaaS, what is infrastructure as a service. It's more to tell you uh, how do we look at the mission of platform as a service. And as, as I said, this is about making developer more productive. And the idea is to empower developers to build great apps and not plumbing middleware and infrastructure. So PaaS is an abstraction layer that sits on top of infrastructure as a service. The unit of deployment is the application. And that's the key thing to understand. You are deploying an app to a PaaS environment. You don't see VMs. You don't see databases. You don't see app servers, web servers. All of this middleware layer that sits on top of the infrastructure as a service is abstracted from you as a developer. That allows you to basically, A, just focus on code, but B, really separate the concerns between what it means to develop an app and what it means to deploy an app. And that's a key in today's uh, world of complex architectures where you really want to focus on just deploying. In terms of where do we sit in the stack, so Cloud Foundry is this abstraction layer on top of, does this work? Oh, great. So this is an, uh, this abstraction layer on top of infrastructure as a service. What's again, what's really unique about Cloud Foundry is it can run on multiple clouds. So basically when you choose your paths, you don't choose the cloud that it's running on. Today we're gonna focus on how we're basically building or deploying and showing you guys the integration we did on top of OpenStack. This chart is actually taken from one of our current customers that are running Cloud Foundry on-prem behind their firewall, building a private cloud uh, and a pass on top of it with Cloud Foundry. Don't worry, it's not your eyes. You're not supposed to see the letters. It's uh, blurb for a reason, because this is the actual deployment model. 
The point here is every colored box here is a manual process. For this specific customers, it takes between five and six months to get an application deployed from the moment the developer finished writing the basic code until this app hits. This is actually all the way to staging, not even production. This is crazy, right? In today's market, we can't wait five to six months until an app is, is, is actually running. Why does it take so much time? Um, you know, you need to open a ticket for someone to provision a server. Then you need to open another ticket for someone to open some configuration in a firewall. And another ticket to, sub to have a database provisioned for you. And then maybe another ticket to have a schema, so on and so on and so on. And you need to do this over and over again when you're moving between development to QA to staging. And what's even worse is you're usually not testing the thing that you actually wrote. So my background, I'm coming from years of um, engineering in the J2E environment. So I had my share of 30,000 lines of Apache config file, which is probably fun to some of us. But others that just want to write uh, great code and build great app probably don't want to deal with Apache config files. So what we aim to do is turn this nightmare into something that is slightly more simple. The idea is that you're deploying a cloud. And you'll hear all about this, how you're actually building the Cloud Foundry instance uh, using Bosch in a few minutes. Then as a developer, which is the blue API here, you are targeting that cloud, you are pushing your code, you are binding a service, and you scale your application. So these are basically the four verbs that you're doing with Cloud Foundry. You are targeting, pushing, binding, scaling. Target means I can target my private cloud, public cloud, micro cloud, which can actually run on this nice little laptop here. Uh, within my private cloud, I can target several environments. So I can target development, development two, QA one, QA two. I can even integrate this into a CI system. So basically the output of a CI build will say, now move my application to the next environment. And the key here is that the app itself doesn't change when you move between environments. So for example, think about that push. I'm just pushing my WAR file, in the case of you guys build Java or Java Spring. Or I'm pushing my .rb file, if you, if you are a .rb folder, if you're building Ruby. So it's really about you finished your app, you're deploying it into the PaaS environment. Services, you don't deal with building mess messaging systems, creating databases. You are binding into all of that as a service. If you want to scale, and you know, part of the reason the Apache config files was 30,000 lines of uh, code is, as I'm sure you know, when you're getting into scaling, you need to scale all of these tiers separately. So the database has one, one scaling schema. Your web servers, app servers have another. Your load balancer, and now you need to uh, define uh, additional DNS entries, and so on and so on. So the PaaS, or the Cloud Foundry specific, really aims at making this much more simple. This is what basically Cloud Foundry looks like, a combination of framework services and clouds. We talked a lot about public, private, micro services. Uh, out of the box, you can provision uh, Postgres, MySQL, Redis, RabbitMQ, MongoDB, and you can plug in your own services. Cloud Foundry is an open source system with um, more than, I think, 7,000 contributions now. We launched Cloud Foundry two years ago. Less than 72 hours after our launch, the open source community already added Erlang, PHP, Python. So in this conference, it's very easy to kind of pitch to the choir about the power of an open source community. So you're getting a lot of contribution because it's A, it's easy to do and to extend, and you will see that in a minute, and B, it's open. It's designed to be pluggable and extendable. So if you want to use your own service, you can plug it into Cloud Foundry. Frameworks, so out of the box we have, uh, you can run Java and Java Spring apps, Ruby on Rails and Sinatra, Node.js, um, Scala, and other languages. And you can also plug in, as I said, you have contributions from the community, you can run PHP apps on Cloud Foundry and so on. It's all open source under the Apache 2 license. 
What you will see in the next few minutes, we'll talk a lot about how you integrate all of that into OpenStack. So basically the idea is once you have Cloud Foundry deployed on any infrastructure as a service, the rest looks exactly the same. So from a developer perspective, the target, bind, scale, push, all looks the same regardless of the underlying infrastructure. One of the um, major use cases we see people using Cloud Foundry, um, including the way we develop Cloud Foundry as part of the Pivotal company now, is this idea that you can progress the app between environments without changing code. So you can move between your development, uh, whether or not you're developing in teams or on your own, all the way to QA and to production. And all of that is done by this target command. So you're just moving the target of your cloud. The power of this is, A, you are not changing the application between the environments. So for example, if you are uh, using a WAR file and, you're, and you are testing, deploying, developing a Java Spring app, for example, you can bind into different databases in the process. So you can develop on a MySQL database for just for the sake of example. And then when you're moving into a, a staging environment, you can change that database into a Postgres database. Your app doesn't change because the level of abstraction is in the right place in the stack because everything is bind as a service. So that really allows you to be, um, it's kind of brings the true agility if you like because the agility of building an app is not only by your development processes, it's also by the idea that you don't waste time waiting for new environments to be set up and moving those up between environments. An example I can give you from another um, big customers of ours in the um, building private CF is that they made a huge effort in being, uh, adopting agile processes. And they really did their development, changed the way they did development and may almost got all the way to like pair programming like Pivotal Lab does if, if you guys are familiar with that. But when they have to deploy the next step of the app, they had to wait three weeks for uh, their IT to set up the next environment. So all of that agility kind of went into waste because they were ready with the code, but then three weeks to set up the next environment. So really that's kind of uh, things you can solve with Cloud Foundry. Why are people using us? Uh, developer productivity, we talked a lot about that. Um, ability to build web apps, social apps faster, um, let developers like yourselves do what they do best, which is build great apps, not 30,000 lines of Apache config file. Sorry for, sorry for getting to that, uh, back to that all, all the time. Um, this is some of our customers that are running Cloud Foundry on-prem today. Uh, there are many more. Um, Intel is building a huge deployment of Cloud Foundry for all of their internal developers. Debuild Comic Relief, if you're familiar with the um, uh, fundraising that was done in the UK uh, a few weeks ago uh, with, uh, I think they raised like 75 million uh, pounds or something like that. All of that was done on Cloud Foundry. What the, the, the system that supported that, I think what's really cool about Comic Relief is how fast they build the application. They actually build it in less than a week. And they use Jenkins in order to kind of progress their application between the dev stage, dev QA staging environment. So they made, so this concept of CF target, a target of a cloud, they integrated that into their Jenkins environment. And once the uh, first stage was over and the uh, CI build was successful, they kind of did target the next environment and they were able to move, progress their app pretty quickly uh, all the way to production. Um, you can't have a session without a big logo slide. So this is our big logo slide. The point here is to make, Cloud Foundry has a huge ecosystem. We have 60 technology partners. A lot of them are in this conference today, um, building different frameworks, um, marketplace for emails, for logging. Um, it's very easy to integrate. Um, it's very uh, compelling for a technology partner to kind of integrate and work with us. And obviously multi-cloud. So deploying on OpenStack, AWS, vSphere, vCloud, um, different environments. Just talk about a few numbers. Um, we have, uh, there are thousands of members on our mailing list. You will see specifically the OpenStack mailing list in, in a few seconds. 
uh, a lot of contributions, and I'll, I'll just skip a little. Um, we talked about this is the major use cases that we see. Agile transformation, dev test trial. So I think this is pretty compelling that you can experiment more, uh, get into more, uh, you know, do more testing, fail fast, all, the, all those nice things that actually you can do if you have easy setup of environments. Um, sorry. So as I said, Cloud Foundry can run on your data center, hosted public clouds, developer laptops. At Pivotal, we are operating uh, one instance of a public cloud, Cloud Foundry, called cloudfoundry.com. Have other partners like AppFog, Tier 3, and, uh, and others that are building other instances of public clouds uh, based on Cloud Foundry. And obviously, you can deploy that on your own environment, which is very popular for OpenStack customers um, using Cloud Foundry Bosch. So the idea here is you're really not locking yourself into any specific environment. You can go to a choice of public clouds and then bring back the app um, internally. You can start internally and then go to the public cloud. One of my previous employers that I will not mention uh, their name here, um, I, was, I was running a project that actually you know, started on AWS and then once it was successful, moving it back into your, our data center. Um, after four or five months, we basically stopped the project because it didn't work. Just too much hassle, too much issues getting the app from the Amazon environment back into our data center. So with Cloud Foundry, it's, you know, hopefully a little bit more than just CF target. It really works. So we have customers doing this today, actually moving between environments. The reason it's, that it's, it's uh, easy to do, and you know, after the session, if you're interested, I can show you a live demo of how this is done. And it's not slideware. It's because the abstraction is in the right place. You are not tapping into the specific of the infrastructures when you're building an app. You are writing your app in the right level of abstraction that really allows it to move, be, move it between environment, public or private. And we think that's the true promise of, of, a, of cloud computing. Um, so this is kind of how the uh, Cloud Foundry logical view looks like. Um, you have routers, so we take care of load balancing your app uh, when you're adding an instance. We make sure we update the DNS. You, we have uh, authentication mechanism, health manager. So for example, if I'm scaling a Cloud Foundry app to like 20 instances or, or 1,200 instances in the case of one of our uh, recent customers, um, we can actually update the load balancer. So if one instance, uh, not only that we're updating the load balancer, but we are maintaining an SLA. So for example, if one instance fails, we will automatically restart another instance to make sure you are keeping your SLA. Um, all of that sits on top of Cloud Foundry Bosch, and that's what allows us to basically be portable across environment. And with that, I'll, uh, we'll transfer into um, an explanation of how we build Cloud Foundry on OpenStack and what is Cloud Foundry Bosch. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, we are going to, to get a bit deeper and we are going to explain how you can deploy Cloud Foundry on premise using whatever a purpose you want to use. If you want to deploy it on vSphere, if you want to deploy it on AWS, or if you want to deploy it on OpenStack. Okay, uh, now we are running CloudFoundry.com. This is our public uh, pass environment, and we are running it on, on, a, on a vSphere environment. This is a big environment. We have about, it depends on the load of the number of the applications that we have, the number of the users that we have, but we, have, we can have uh, about uh, one, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 5,000 uh, VMs running. Uh, we have a lot of different node types. We have some VMs that are rigid to run some databases. We have other types of nodes that we can run some web services, etc. We have more than 75 unique software packages. You have uh, saw in a previous slide that we uh, run a lot of uh, frameworks. If you want to run a Rails application, if you want to run a Play, a Go, uh, whatever, whatever kind of application you want to run. So we have to deploy that kind of frameworks uh, on, on our production environment. We have also uh, different uh, web servers uh, anywhere. Our environment is a 24, 
for seven, running all, all year. And the most important thing in our production environment is that our developers, our engineers, they deploy the bits that run Cloud Foundry, any of dates on that bit, they deploy by themselves on the production environment twice a week. And the way that we want to deploy that bit is that we don't want to have any downtime. So we need some kind of variable, robust, repeatable deployments, uh, a tool that can help us to uh, deploy all of our Cloud Foundry bits with any, with, uh, without any uh, downtime. Okay, uh, we have a lot of uh, Cloud Foundry engineers. We need the kind of tool that empowers them to do that. Uh, when we started uh, with CloudFoundry.com, one of the things that we started trying to, to find is a tool chain that help us to deploy Cloud Foundry with, without uh, that, that time. We look at a lot of tools, like Chef, Puppet, uh, a lot of tools, different tools, but we always find that we need to find, we, we need to add some kind of logic layer between that tools and what we wanted to do. So we didn't feel uh, enough comfortable with that tools, so we decided to create another tool and start from a scratch and create another tool. This tool is called uh, Bosch. What is Bosch, Cloud Foundry Bosch? Uh, Cloud Foundry Bosch is a tool chain for release engineering, so you can, uh, make some releases when, when, when we date our, our code for crowdfunding.com. Uh, it's a tool that helps, it helps us to deploy our crowdfunding in whenever, uh, whatever environment we are, we are using. If we want to deploy in our development environments, if we want to run it in our QA environment, or if we want to run it on our, deploy it on our production environment. And it's also a life cycle management tool. What does it mean? That means that we don't want a tool that just uh, set up a new environment. We, win, we want a tool that it was able to make updates on uh, running production systems. And if we want to move uh, that uh, environment from one hypervisor to another one, so we can do that uh, with, an, with an easy tax. It's a tool that's, that is really optimized for large-scale uh, distributed systems. It's something that we are running uh, on CloudFoundry.com. And what we need is to enable the systematic and prescriptive evolution of, of services. So what we want to do is to define which are the services, which are the environments, which are the resources that we need to run each of the different node types so we were able to deploy it in a proper way. And the most important thing is, as I said previously, is that we want the, the service updates with a uh, consistent result. And, and the most important thing is that uh, we want a minimal to no downtime. A Cloud Foundry Bosch also facilitate, uh, facilitates operation on any large uh, service or any infrastructure. We have used it and we are still using it to run uh, CloudFoundry.com, so it's a proven, proven technology. And actually, it supports different, uh, different hyper source or cloud or public cloud infrastructure like AWS, OpenStack, BFS, or BCloud. Just before going deeper in, in how we integrate uh, Cloud Foundry Bosch with, with OpenStack, just a, a very few concepts. Uh, the Bosch components that we have is, the first thing that we have is a source. Source codes. So when you want to deploy a new environment, you have some kind of source code. It could be your application, a Python, a Ruby, a C, whatever you want. You, ha you have this kind of source. Sometimes uh, you don't have the source because what you want to deploy is, for example, is a database, it's a web server, uh, it's anything. So you have a, a tar file, a RPM, uh, whatever you want. So this is what we call it a blob, a blob file. Uh, when you have this source or you have this source, uh, these, these block files, what you need to specify is how you are going to install that code or how are you, style, uh, you are going to install that web server or database, etc. This is what we call a package. A package is nothing more than the instructions on how, to the, how you are going to install that software, how you are going to monitor that software, how are you going to start and how are you going to stop that, that, that uh, different uh, services. 
for example, another, another example could be if, if you have some kind of database, so before you stop the database, you want to, to, flush, uh, to flush the cache, or you want to drain some kind of buffer or anything, anything else. This is something that you can specify on the package. The package also allows you to set up which is the version of the source code that you're going to deploy. On a higher level, you, we have, a, we have a, a job. The job is it's, uh, the way that uh, we describe how uh, we're going to roll out the package in a different VM. So you cannot specify which is the template you're going to use because some, sometimes you have a package. This package has uh, several configuration files, so you need to specify which is the contents of that configuration files. Uh, that configuration files uh, should change between the different uh, environments. For example, if you are going to deploy a database in a development environment, you, do, you will not have the same contents of that configuration file that if you are going to deploy that service in a production environment. So because you are going to use a different number of workers, a different memory size, etc., etc. Et and then when you have all of the jobs, you create a release. A release is how it ties all of that different components together. It's just to deploy, okay, I'm going to run, uh, we're, going, we're going to deploy CloudFoundry.com. We have a release that it has several jobs, that jobs could be which are the databases that we're going to use, which are the frameworks, etc., etc. Then we have another concept. Uh, we, we call it a stem cells. A stem cells is nothing more than, than a VM template or a VM image. So instead of uh, spin out a new VM and uh, a vanilla Im image, that what we have done is what we create a, a, some kind of pre-baked uh, VM, image, image file. That stem cell has several components that are used by the director. For example, an agent that is able to communicate with the different components and say which is the state of the different uh, components that are running inside of that VM, for example, uh, which is the uh, network configuration, which is the uh, different disk size that we have uh, there. And then we have the deployments. The deployments is nothing more than a configuration file that says, okay, you have a release. For example, you have the CloudFoundry.com, uh, the CloudFoundry release. If you are going to deploy that, uh, that release, uh, depending on which environment you are going to deploy that, this is when you set which is the uh, different values of the, the configuration files that you have specified on the templates that I explained it, uh, before in the, in, the, in the jobs. Okay, which is the architecture of the, of the Cloud Foundry bot? The, the Cloud Foundry bot has several components. The first one is a, is a CLI, it's about CLI, it's how the users can interact uh, with the systems, and it interacts with a component that we call the director. The director is nothing more than the orchestrator, orchestrator all of that uh, environment. The director has also uh, a REST API, so if you don't want to use the CLI, you can interact directly with the REST API using a, I don't know, a web dashboard, or if you want to interact with your own system, you can, you can do that. Uh, we have also a blob store. A blob store is where we store all the different packages. It could be the source code, it could be the, I don't know, the, the, the package for the MySQL tar file or the web server or whatever uh, you want. That blob store, we, in, Bosch, in Bosch we provide a simpler blob store, but if you want to use your own blob store, you can use uh, several. For example, if you want to use the Amazon S3, or if you want to use an OpenStack uh, Swift object of storage, or if you want to use, I don't know, Rackspace Space Cloud Files or HTTP uh, object store, you can use that global store. We have also some workers that is uh, what uh, they, they perform, the, the, the several actions that the CLI uh, has to the director. Uh, we have also a Mr. Bush. A Mr. Bush is, is, a, is we are using a, a component that's called NATS, and is the responsible to talk with just the different uh, the different VMs. VMs. And we have a health monitor. The health monitor is responsible to check which is the state of the different VMs that are running, 
and just alert the director if you have, for example, some VM that has been stopped or is not running or the agent that is running inside the VM is not responding, for example. The head monitor has an, archi an architecture that uh, uh, it can be extensible. So, if, for example, if you want to integrate the, the health monitor with your own monitoring system, if you are using, I don't know, the CA, HP, or ABN, or whatever you are using, you can, via, via plugin, you can extend that health monitor in order to uh, integrate with that kind of services. Then we have the, the IIS uh, CPI. The director itself and all of the different components are agnostics in terms of what hypervisor or uh, cloud provider uh, are you using. The responsible to talk with your cloud provider is, I will, is always the IS interface. I will show you uh, a, few, a few seconds later uh, how it's, it's, it's built. And finally, we have the agents. In the agents, this is, a, uh, this is something that runs inside the VM and it's able to communicate with the different components of the, the Cloud Foundry Bosch. So I have said that uh, Cloud Foundry Bosch is neutral in terms of what uh, I, yes, I, are you using. Nowadays, we support three main players. The first one is, is in VMware. So we have CPIs for vSphere and we have uh, a connector for vCloud Director. For vSphere, it has been tested a lot. This is what we are using to run cloudfoundry.com. For vCloud Director, we have the code. We have not tested it. For AWS, we have the code. We have been testing it extensively. We have run in about uh, 400 uh, VMs in AWS, and we are planning to run about 5,000 VMs in AWS to check that it really was. And for OpenStack, uh, we have the code complete, but we have only tested on small uh, environments right now. Okay, the cloud provider interface. The cloud provider interface, as I said, is who is responsible to tell with uh, the IIS. It has a well-defined contract. So it, it is the only, the only way that we can separate uh, the director, all of the Bosch components, from the EIS. So this is the contract that we have. We have a contract for stem cells. It's nothing more than image. We have a contract how, how to spin out new VMs, how to let that, that, that VMs, uh, how to configure the network for that VMs, and we have also uh, some contract for, for this. Uh, the OpenStack CPI it interacts with several OpenStack components. For the VMs, for the stem cells, the image, we are interacting with, with OpenStack LANs. This is the image service. For the VMs, we are basically interacting with OpenStack Nova IPA. This is our primary uh, IPA where we are touching it, but Nova also talks with other components. For example, if you want to deploy a complex uh, networking topology, so for example, if you want to use static IPs for uh, HBM, you can use the OpenStack Quantum APA in order to set up which is the networking of that, uh, of that VM. Uh, we also talk with OpenStack Cinder APA in order to uh, create new volumes, in order to attach the volumes to the VMs. And for the blob store, if you want to run your own private blob store, so you, want, you don't want to use some kind of public uh, blob store, you can use, uh, use the OpenStack Swift uh, API. Now, let's check some a simple deployment file that I will show that once you have a release that is agnostic in terms of what, where are you going to deploy it, if you are going to deploy a development or a production environment, or if you are going to deploy on a vSphere or on Amazon or OpenStack, this is completely agnostic. On the deployment file is where you specify which is the settings that the deploy is going to be uh, run on. The first thing is that you specify which is the name of the deployment that you are going to, to deploy. In this case, this is a basic uh, example of a WordPress. You can check in GitHub uh, that, that example. Uh, this is the director OE, so in your environment you can have several directors because you can 
I don't know, you, you want to separate different uh, organization units and each, each one uh, should have a different director, for example, of you, you have uh, one director targeted to Amazon, another one for OpenStack, whatever you want. Then you specify which is the release, which is the version of the release that you're going to deploy. For example, in production environment, you want to deploy, I don't know, the version number one, and even your development environment, you are just using a version two or version three, whatever you want. Then we use uh, a compilation. Compilation VMs is something interesting because before we deploy a release, uh, we compile the packages. So what we want to know is that what we are going to deploy, we, we will not have any problems when we deploy that. So the first one that, the first thing that we do is we compile the package. The compile the package is nothing more that we take which is the source code, we take the package and install it on a, on a vanilla VM without any, anything more. If it works, then we will go the, with the next steps that is to deploy the, the process. And here you can define which is the, the number of workers, the number of compilation VMs that we are going to use, et cetera, et cetera. And we have some specific load properties that you can define, for example, which is the science type that you are going to use. If you know that uh, it's a big package, you can use an M1 large, or you can define here the, the, the custom instance times that you have on, on your own OpenStack environment. The next thing is the update. So when you have a, a run in deployment, if you want to update that, instead of rolling out all of the dates on a once, what we do is create some canary instance. On that canary instance, what we do is we deploy that bit and just checks the number, we wait the number of seconds that is specified here to see that that deploy is working. See if it's working, then we go, we, or we proceed with the, uh, with the next steps. The next thing that, that you should uh, define is the network topology. Uh, we support three kinds of network topologies. We can use a dynamic network. That is basically if, if you are if you're in your OpenStack environment, you are using uh, the flat DHCP manager, for example. So your VMs are going to ping DHCP to fetch which is the, the IP address. This is what we call dynamic address. So you, you don't know which is the IP address that, that VMs are going to use. And we have the manual Networks. On the manual networks, if you're going to, to use the manual networks, you need to, to use OpenStack Quantum. Mm -hmm. And the third one is if you want to use the floating EP. It, it could be combined, combined with a dynamic and with a, a static IPs. So for example, you have a private environment with, without any access from the outside, but one of the VMs, uh, you want that it can be accessed from the outside. So in that VM, you can uh, set which, uh, a floating IP for, for that VM. In case you're using a manual network, this is what defined, which is the range or the IP address that you're going to use, the gateway. This is the, the IP address that are reserved that you don't want to use. And this is the, uh, the range of the IP address that you are going to use for your uh, deployment. And then you have a specific cloud properties. The cloud properties, you can define which is the uh, security group that you are going to use and which is the network ID, the, the OpenStack network ID that you are going to use. Uh, you can have several networks. For example, I have here uh, a default that is a manual network, but I could have several uh, network topologies. For example, if, if I want to use, uh, I don't know, some kind of web service, and that web service I want to deploy on an, an, a specific IP range, or if I have also a database service, I can deploy that database service on a different uh, network subnet, for example. So you can define here uh, whatever network uh, you want. Then uh, we define the resource pools. The resource pools, uh, what it says is, which is the stem cell that you are going to use, so we can have different stem cells if you want, and which is the cloud properties uh, that one you want to use. For example, we know that, I don't know, we have a database service and it should be run in a large instance and perhaps I have another kind of service that it should be run in a, in a, in a small environment. And then we have the jobs. This is where we set 
which is the uh, different jobs, which is are the different packages that we are going to deploy in our environment. Here we define which is the template of the job package that we are going to use, the number of instances that, uh, that we want to deploy, uh, the resource pools that we want to use, in the case is, is the common one, but we can have uh, several resource pools, the network that we are, we are going to use, and for that instance, which is the IP address that, uh, that uh, we want to, to set. And then we have the properties. The properties uh, can be specified for each of the of different elements that, that we want to use. In that case, for example, is an example, but we have an, an MySQL server. We have, this is the IP address that we want to use for that MySQL server. This is the password that we can, they can, we can use for an NFS server, for our uh, WordPress, et cetera, et cetera. So how is the, the, the workflow when you need to create a, a, a new release? In the case, uh, what you have to do is you target your development environment. You create a development environment with all of your uh, deployment uh, manifest file with all of the different uh, properties that you will have in that deployment, and then you write the code. When you have uh, rated all of the code, you can create a release. A create release, what it does is uh, it gets all of the source code, all of the different packages, takes together and creates a, a tar file. With that tar file, then you blow up that tar file using the Bosch blower release to the director, and then you can deploy that director. You run all of the tests, and it works. Commit the changes and proceed to the next step. If no, you iterate until your deployed is running. When you have uh, it has been done, then uh, you pass that. You can pass that, for example, for the QA uh, uh, department. On the QA, you do the same. You create a deployment targeted to that QA environment. Uh, you pull the code that the developer has created. Uh, you create a different release. You blow up that release to the director. Deploy, run test, you can iterate. If it doesn't work, you report that to development, to development guys. And if it works, you create a Bosch uh, release with, with final. And then you commit that deployment. And in the production, it's exactly the same. You pull all of the code from the QI guys, you blow up the release, deploy the release, run test. So it's exactly the same pattern that it can be used for the development guys, for the QA guys, or for the people who are responsible to uh, the release uh, engineering. And that's all. Uh, what's next? Uh, you can sign up at cloudfoundry.com if you want to use that prompt code. So you get, uh, you, you get a free access to the Cloud Foundry code form. You can test it, whatever you want. You can deploy your applications. When you have tested it, if you want to deploy Cloud Foundry, for example, on premise, on your own installations, uh, we have several links here. Uh, this is where in GitHub where you can find all of the code, or Cloud Foundry, or Cloud Foundry Bosch, whatever you want. Uh, uh, on GitHub, we have also some kind of documentation that um, explains how to deploy Cloud Foundry on your installation. And you have uh, questions about how Cloud Foundry works or how uh, Cloud Foundry uh, Bosch uh, works you have uh, several uh, mailing lists. And that's all. If you have uh, any questions, we are kindly to, to answer that. Yep. So um, what's the multi-tenancy model outcome? Do we allow multiple tenants in the same VM? Or do you always force the one VM per tenant? So, <coughs> So this is completely configurable using Box. So when you're creating the environment, you can decide if you're running in a completely single tenant mode, uh, per one app per container, or multi tenant. So this is something that is completely configurable per the instance of your your line. When we are running CloudFoundry.com, we have a complete multi tenant model. So we have 5,000 VMs that can support hundreds of thousands of apps. So, but that's one way to do it. When you are a customer that is deploying this on prem. Usually running a single tenant or close to a single tenant. And they're actually changing this between their dev environment, their QA environment, and their production environment. 
So every Bosch deployment that you've seen here, can, you can control the number of, or the uh, tenancy of apps versus mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So yeah, so what you said is in cloud-founded.com, you are ready to have that we are multi by cloudfunding.com, our public service, we are multi tenant correct. Mm -hmm. So you have isolation by account. So when you're, so when you're signing up with your account, you're isolated from the other tenants based on the account, but there is no physical isolation. So in the same big VM, you have multiple apps. Yep. Uh, the health monitor, uh, which you discussed about, uh, does it also have mechanism to scale the underlying infrastructure, uh, the VM itself? So, so hmm. the way the way it works is actually really. Uh, do you want to take that? Oh yeah, no, you can do that. But uh, Health Monitor right now doesn't provide any mechanism to auto scale your application. We're working on that, but uh, you know, it, you you can work if you want. You see, you can you can extend it via a plugin. But uh, we we will provide some kind of auto scaling mechanism for VMs. Yeah. But, but let's let's understand there are two levels of scaling. Right? Yeah. The scaling of the app, the instances, the instances mm -hmm. that the developer will do. There is scaling of the cloud capacity. No. We, from a developer perspective, you, for you, the cloud is, have infinite capacity. You never know that you know you're approaching any kind of limit. You have so you can scale your app uh, in your based on your account uh, profile up and down as much as you like, and that health monitor actually allows you to kind of we, we will automatically uh, start a new instance if your instance fails. Now scaling the cloud itself. Using Bosch, this is something that currently you're doing uh, in a much more manual way. So we are doing this twice a week in cloudfunding.com, right? We scale from zero users to hundreds of thousands of users. We keep adding capacity, and you never see us say, next Tuesday, 2 a.m., you will have 10 minutes of downtime, right? It's all done behind the scenes. So, so what's, what's, what's the instance of, so, like, you said apps, you yep. scale the app. So the, the mapping for an IAS instance of the VM, What's the equivalent That's instance? the beauty. You don't, you, there is a complete abstraction. There is no relationship between a VM and an app. This, this, the concept of VM doesn't exist. From a developer perspective, you see an instance, you see an app, you never know how many, you don't see a VM, you don't start a VM, you don't stop a VM as a developer. This is a, this is a different model than infrastructure as a service. Okay? This is PaaS, which means you as, as a user only so, deploy app. Yeah, so you don't we have a pretty VM. short break here, we'll have to... Okay. Go ahead, you guys. Okay, thank you.